My name's Ashley Arca. I'm fourth year BFA student here at Visual Arts, and I'm the current Visual Arts Society president. Hi, I'm Chloe, and I'm in my fourth year at the Bachelor of Visual Arts program at the University of Windsor. I'm Victoria Guioni. I'm a third year student at the School of Creative Arts. I heard about the pop-up art show through Facebook. They just had like a call for a submission sign. I heard about the pop-up art show through the Visual Arts Society at the school. Well, the Visual Arts Society is basically an extension of kind of student parliament. So here we have students who kind of represent the visual arts student body as a whole. The pop-up show was essentially um, kind of a way to bring over the visual arts back onto main campus, kind of trying to bridge that gap. In terms of creating the pop-up show, a lot of people seem to be really interested in wanting to see all the works that we had done and we essentially wanted to give people an opportunity to kind of sell their work and give them a little bit of exposure instead of just staying within the building. Mainly third and fourth years were kind of the focus. They wanted to help support more the graduating students of the year. I submitted some small handmade cards, some small sculptures, some medium-sized illustrations, just so that way there was a wide variety of things for sale at the show. Some of the work that I submitted were paper carving, so basically I'm working with like negative and positive space, and I just take a sheet of paper and I do a design on it and carve it out, and then I put it on a black background, so I had those framed up, and it's something new that I've been doing, so it's pretty fun to get some feedback on it. I submitted some of my own paintings just to kind of fill in the space. My paintings generally, they kind of range in subject, but we always try, for the pop-up show at least, we tried to give um, the students something more of a commercial kind of outlook, something that we know people would be interested in purchasing. Um, it was my first time trying to sell my work, so it was definitely like an interesting experience. Um, I had to figure out like price points and like what would sell and what wouldn't. Uh, pretty good. I did fairly well in sales. I'm pretty used to being in art shows by this time. I've been in several over the past few years. I definitely think the pop-up show was good exposure just because I don't think a lot of the programs really are aware that we even have an art school going on here, so it was cool for them to see what we can do and have some creativity generated throughout the U. I think the pop-up shop was a great chance to give the art program a little bit of exposure. Uh, a lot of people aren't aware that there even is an art program at the University of Windsor because the LaBelle building is fairly isolated from main campus. So I think the pop-up art shop was a great chance to get Soka out into the CAW and a lot of people were very friendly and excited to see what the art program was and what all the artists had to offer and show everybody. I think in terms of showcasing what people here do, it was a really good first time trial. I mean, there were a lot of things that we could have tweaked to make it a little bit better, but it was overall a really good learning experience. A lot uh, to do differently, I think we should have uh, worked on a lot more exposure. Um, because we're so limited with the number of people who are actually in the Visual Arts Society, it made things a little bit difficult to actually go and do all the jobs that we needed to do. Onactus is really a team of students that all share the same passion of developing themselves as a leader. Um, and coming together to improve the lives of people within their community and abroad. It's really, uh, it's different for everyone, but at the end of the day, the projects really are what bring everyone together because we look at real world problems and, you know, um, take things from scratch and really use entrepreneurship to develop projects that are going to address these needs and provide solutions that are not only going to help assist in those issues, but actually you know, solve them in a more sustainable manner. Fifteen members of our Enactus Windsor team went to Mississauga, Toronto for our Enactus Regionals competition, which basically means that we competed against all the Central Canada University's Enactus teams and presented on a different Enactus project that fell into the three pillars of eco-living, financial literacy, and entrepreneurship. For entrepreneurship, we presented on City Thrive, which is a program that helps uh, get people off social assistance, as well as cook up financial literacy. We presented on three projects, City Thrive, which I just mentioned, 
You Thrive, where we work with high school students to start their own micro businesses, as well as We Thrive. And then environmental sustainability, uh, we presented on a new project called Project Relief, where we are trying to provide a filtration system that helps purify water in a remote village in South Africa. We started preparing for this competition uh, approximately four months ago. The four presenters that are actually presenting, along with our alternate and our director, work on writing the script. And then once we're finished, we work with the tech team to make sure the visual aspect is aligned with the actual script. It's where the team kind of came together, bonded. A lot of the presenters weren't on the projects they presented on, but that's where they got more uh, closer to the projects, closer to the project managers, closer to the um, other members who are working on the projects. So it was a very collaborative effort, obviously, and brought us all together very closely. From the start, just being on the bus, everyone's very uh, excited, very happy to be together, obviously. And then once we got got to our hotel, we filled the entire main lobby with such energy that other Anakis teams kind of, you know, looked at us as, wow, you know, they're super cool and they're super energetic. My experience at Regionals was fantastic. It was very electrifying and it was exciting to see other teams performing and listening to other projects and what others are doing for their community. It was really eye-opening for me. Getting a chance to experience firsthand what we do week in week out, changing lives in Windsor, and then being able to be part of an amazing team of six of us that made the script and did the tech and worked for hours and hours every week to then tell the story of these people here to everyone in Ontario is an incredible experience. This was my first time presenting at regionals and actually my first time even attending a regionals competition. The feeling walking into the room when our whole team was standing there watching you, my heart was beating really fast. And then as we get up there, I had my team with me and we gained the confidence to actually present and it went really well. And then our team stood up and cheered and it was the best feeling in the world. I love the idea of Windsor being the most energetic, the most passionate, and one of the most successful schools at the competition. At the award ceremony at the end of the night, my team, the entrepreneurship team, we were in the front and we were just all holding each other, awaiting the results. And then when we found out we got first place, it was just it's such an amazing feeling. And at that point we realized like all the hard work we did like paid off and it was definitely worth it. And going to regionals, it just takes it to that next level where you're sharing your story as well as the story of other people in your community of who you're empowering with the world. And that's, some, that's something that really, um, it makes it all real. Do more. Do more. Do more. Do more. Do more. My name is Tracy Wynn and I am the co-founder and co-manager of the Hwasan Dance Team. It's a group of uh, young adults age ranging from 16 to 24 who get together and perform traditional dance, traditional Vietnamese dances and the traditional lion dance. We do a variety of events. We, we sometimes do weddings. We perform, you know, with Asian culture, it's really important to have lion dance because the lion dance represents um, good luck, bringing in good luck and warding off bad spirits. So uh, it's good to have at weddings. A lot of people sometimes even have it at baby showers. Um, we also do tr cultural events, so events across Windsor that has to do with, you know, the Carousel of Nations or Celebration of Nations at the university. Um, and then we do events like private events as well, so award banquets they tend to have us or galas in general. Yeah. Um, I started dancing with this team essentially about five years ago. We we were asked by some adults to come to the Linsung Temple to help them with their annual Lunar New Year festival and perform in a, a fashion show slash dance with our traditional uh, Vietnamese garments and the variations of that garment. So. 
we had a bunch of girls get together and we did one quick like five minute fashion show it wasn't anything formal and then the following year we were asked to do the same thing and of the many girls that showed up in the first year only six returned the second year and I was part of that six and and that's when we didn't do the fashion show and we did a dance and following that event we realized you know this is something that we can continue and would like to continue and from there Hua Sun Dance team was established. Since then um, from six people we've actually grown our team to 24 people. It's very easy to join. Um, all you got to do is reach out to us. We, we can be founded on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Just give us a message uh, to explain that you're interested. We also have an email. Uh, or talk to any one of our members of the dance team. If you know anybody on our dance team, just ask that you're interested. And you don't need any experience. You don't, you know, part of the philosophy of the Hua San dance team is to make dance accessible for all. We understand, you know, formal dancing classes can run up to $500 a month on top of outfits, uniforms, and competition fees. So we wanted to make it so that it's accessible for all and free for all, most importantly. And it's, it's part of just expressing your creative self or expressing a part of you through dance performance. So to join, as long as you have um, enthusiasm and you're willing to learn and you have an open mind, that's all you need. And from there, we'll work out with any skill level and we'll move forward with that. Travelers can be fun, but sometimes they can be dangerous. Do you know what aren't dangerous? Sandbags. Of course they're not dangerous. They're sandbags. They don't do anything. <laughs> See? Nothing. They're supportive. They have your back. They don't do anything. And they're always safe. Go along! Ow! Oh, dude! I guess they weren't as safe as you thought they were. So much goes into the creation of a, of a, of a film, um, everything from pre-production to, to editing and everything in between. And it's, it's really hard to remember everything. I mean, you, the, the producer will do days of work just to like secure good catering. And then you're trying to remember the name of some production assistant who brought you coffee. Um, but I mean, no matter how hard you try, you're going to forget some things. You're going to not remember some things. I remember my first time on a set. I was in my first year of film school and they just threw us to the wolves. No teaching, uh, no instruction, nothing. So the, we find a bunch of gear and the director of photography says, hey Jim, grab the sandbags. And I remember thinking, what the f is a sandbag? It's a bag filled with sand. A, a bag filled with sand, that's it. It, it's so simple yet so important. The ones I work with are always orange. You can get other colors like black or what have you, but I find they get lost in the shuffle that way. You know, if you're working in a dark studio and you see something orange, you automatically think, whoa, that thing is probably important. I mean, it's about time people start kind of realizing and giving them the credit that they're, uh, they're due. I mean, put it this way, if I'm on set and I have to make a decision um, about one item that I can use, okay, it's gonna be sandbags every time. If, if I got an actress and she's complaining about her contract, we can't afford her, she wants too much money, hmm, let me see, how does that interfere with our sandbag production uh, cost? Okay, yeah, well, I'll take the sandbags every time, priorities. What's gonna mark your dolly endpoint? Sandbags, that's what. What's gonna straighten your dolly when you have to use that f***ing tubular one that's been stuck in the case for weeks? F***ing sandbags, that's what. But not everyone recognizes that, and that's a damn shame. I was rigging a light by attaching a global arm to a C-stand, so although the stand is here, the light is angled over there, and I got sandbags on the C-stand, obviously. One of the other grips calls for sandbags to put in another part of the studio so one of the production assistants grabs the ones I was using because he thinks he thinks they're not needed there anymore and 
And as he lifts them and starts walking away, the fixture, the fixture falls on him. He's unconscious. They take him to the hospital and then... And, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Those were dark times. It's up to people like me, people like us, to educate the public. We're responsible. I made a petition on change.org to implement stricter sandbag tutorials in film schools across the nation. I would encourage you to check it out and your friends as well. We're substantially under our target right now. Well, and they're there for a reason. Safety, security, support. And, and us as the filmmakers, we're there all for the same reason. We want to complete the production. And we're there to support each other and, and to get that support from the sandbags. I guess you could say there's a little bit of sandbag in all of us. You know what's holding this chair down right now? Not my body weight, that's for sure. These sandbags. Don't ever forget. Come on, come on, come on, three more, three more! I can't, I can't do it! Seriously? You lift like a girl, you throw like a girl. Three more, I'll make you wear a dress. Deal. There's seriously something wrong with you, man. Go to Empire Muscle tonight and get a gym membership. And push, drop, push three, push, get it. Get it on that leg, three. Get it up on the rack. Yeah. Well, pretty much there's a, there's a certain way that I like to train, that I like to lift weights and work out. And uh, it just so happens that that way I like to train kind of tends to overlap with the way some competitive athletes like to work out. Powerlifters, you know, some bodybuilders, strength athletes like to work out in a similar way. So I put Empire Muscle together to be a place where people who like to lift in that certain style, you know, it's a little, a little rougher, a little dirtier than your typical fitness gym, your typical fitness club. So uh, Empire Muscle is just a place for people who, who don't prefer all the glitz and the, the fancy stuff of a typical, a typical gym can come and just do work, you know. So where, where are your cardio machines? We don't have cardio machines here at Empire Muscle. I believe that anything you want to accomplish, you can accomplish here with weights and plates and barbells. Wow. You don't need to spend hours on a treadmill. Mm -hmm. So like there's no point for you to go run inside? Uh, well, you know, things like that depend a great deal on a person's goals and the type of, you know, activity that they're pre preparing for, the reason they're in the gym in the first place. Um, like I said, I put this place together because there's a certain way I like to train and a certain type of preparation that I prefer to do. And for me and, you know, some other athletes like me, that doesn't include hours spent on a treadmill or a stationary bike. <laughs> Alright, let's go. I'm going to see off. Ready? If you're singing, you're not working hard. Push, three. Pretty experienced with weightlifting, plates and barbells and dumbbells and things like that, but there's no reason that has to be the case. Uh, we can more than accommodate people who are just interested in the sport, so really all they need is uh, an interest and a willingness to come down and do some hard work. Okay, cool. If you have, like, if you were showing me how to do everything, do you offer personal training? Oh, uh, we have some personal trainers that we work with, and uh, we're more than happy to set new clients up with, uh, with our training staff and they can work something out. Chest height? Chest height. Put your pictures on those rings. Set up, get underneath, make sure you're on set. Center. Step forward a little bit, your hips under the bar. Stand straight up. Step back. Good, now get low. Make it so I can read what's on your shirt. I'll be able to see what's on your shirt the whole way down. Keep that chest up, get your ass down a little bit. Anything else you want to know about the space or your shell or whatever? Uh, maybe just the location. We're down here on Crawford Avenue at 925, right at the intersection of Crawford and College on Windsor's West End. Thanks for joining us. Uh, tonight we have uh, Carl Benesoy joining us. How are you doing, Carl? I'm good, thanks. Thank you for having me. So, you're a uh, music student at the uh, university here. Yeah. 
I'm a fourth year piano major here at the university. Um, well, I was also born and raised here, and I went to a Walkerville Collegiate for piano. Oh, okay. Um, how long have you been playing the piano? A long time. Since I was four, I was self-taught for the majority of my life. Then I, when I went to Walkerville, I studied under Mary Jean Peters and Maureen Harris, and now I'm with my current teacher, Dr. Gregory Butler. Tell us about uh, the piece you're going to be playing for us tonight. I will be playing an excerpt from Mendelssohn's Piano Concerto Number no. 1 in G minor. He's written two concertos, one in D minor and G minor, and both are vastly, they're tenacious, let me tell you that. It requires a lot of technique. And when these guys were writing it down, were they on LSD or anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. No, from my knowledge, um, Berlioz was high on opiates when he wrote uh, Symphony Fantastique. I mean, that's one of the best examples I can give you for that sort of thing, but no, not Mendelssohn. Seems like that era of creativity had no real limits. Well, it was the 19th century romantic era and everything was happening, revolution, whatnot. Do you feel like you're playing a story in your head when you're playing it all? Or? I feel as though as musicians, we're salesmen, really. We're trying to sell what the composer wrote to the audience. And if in some way it can affect a viewer or an audience member, then we know we did our job right. And what kind of pieces do you like to pick? What do you like to leave your audiences with? <laughs> Hopefully in awe. No, okay. <laughs> That's interesting, because I was trying to hold in my laughter. No, I'm just kidding. No. It, was, it was amazing. <laughs> no, but it was good. And like, what other pieces like have you tried to master? And well, aside from the traditional canon of classical music, we have like Bach, Beethoven, Chopin, and all that. I do like to improvise on my own thoughts at the piano any time I can. It, I feel it just engages the brain, and I love jazz music. <laughs> if I wasn't in love with classical, I would be in jazz, but classical music has something that... <laughs> so, uh, have you uh, composed any pieces yourself? Yeah, um, I'm currently in a class with Dr. Brentley, and we have a composition project. I wrote a solo piano piece for it called Dawn of Spring, heavily influenced by WC and the imagery of nature around it. So, Nice, nice. What do you relate to the most? What do you get your inspiration from? What do I get my inspiration from? Well... Could be television. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be... No, um, anything realistically. Um, I could just be... Like every morning I drive my car and park way out in the sticks on California because free parking, right? And I just, I love walking to the campus and every now and then I'll just, just walk, be in my thoughts and it, it'll be like, oh, okay, well, that's, it's calming. Or I'll drive by the river at nighttime and look at the river and it's just peaceful and you can see the lights from Detroit and I'll try and incorporate that imagery into my music. What are some plans that you have after uh, finishing university? Well, I'm coming back for a fifth year, just half a semester to get my electives, then the master's in performance. Yeah? Hmm? yeah man. No PhD, no... Well, you got to <laughs> do the master's to get the DMA and the PhD and all that fun stuff. You got to have all those different letters in front of your name. Yeah, well, you know. and, uh, it's fun, right? <laughs> I think that's well, thank you for having me. No, thank yeah, you. No, for thank you. Me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Pleasure. So, later tonight, we'll be hearing Carl uh, perform for us. <laughs> 